Welcome, and let's first talk compliance. I'm Catherine Short, Partnership Marketing Specialist at First Healthcare Compliance. Thanks for tuning in. You can follow First Healthcare Compliance on Twitter at FirstHCC or on Facebook and Instagram at First Healthcare Compliance and our show hashtag First Talk Compliance. On today's episode, I'm talking to Jill Longo, a healthcare attorney for Health Insurer Medical Mutual of Ohio about durable medical equipment. We will discuss to what this refers and many other considerations in this realm. Prior to joining Medical Mutual, Jill had great success representing healthcare providers through CMS and private payer audits and appeals. Jill previously advised practitioners and durable medical equipment providers on Medicare, Medicaid, HIPAA High Tech, Anti-Kickback, and Stark Compliance. She is a former attorney advisor to administrative law judges at the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals and worked in the General Counsel's Office of a major durable medical equipment manufacturer. Jill has extensive experience with healthcare contract review and negotiations and is adept at drafting legally sound agreements that protect and promote the business endeavors of her clients. She focuses on protecting her clients from concerns unique to the healthcare industry, including HIPAA high tech, anti-kickback, and stark liability. So Jill, welcome to First Talk Compliance. How are you today? I'm doing well, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So what exactly is durable medical equipment? Okay, so um, a durable medical equipment is, it's. I'll give you the Medicare definition, which most in the context of our conversation today, I'm going to be talking about Medicare. But I will preface this with saying that many uh, Private insurers follow the same kinds of rules as Medicare. So while I'm giving you the Medicare definition of durable medical equipment, I would say that, you know, 95% of private insurers also follow these same definitions and rules that I'm going to discuss with you today. So with that said, durable medical equipment is equipment that can withstand repeated use. Um, It's primarily and customarily used to serve a medical purpose. It's generally not useful to a person who does not have an illness or injury, and it's appropriate for use in the home, meaning that it's something that a person can use on their own without assistance from a physician or other type of practitioner. So what type of products are included in this category? Well, there's durable medical equipment, like I just explained. That would include things such as canes, walkers, oxygen tanks, um, a CPAP, wheelchairs. Uh, A lot of times you think of it in terms of things that help with mobility and ambulation, but also, you know, oxygen tanks, portable things that can be used at home. Um, Other devices also fit under this category, like certain types of beds, lifts, and that kind of thing. Um, It also includes uh, the category of prosthetics and orthotics, so that includes, uh, you know, like your legs and leg and back braces, which I know are, are, are popular items that uh, many people need. Um, leg, back, neck, ankle braces, that kind of thing. Um, anything that's uh, a device that's used to support a, a, like a weak body part or maybe to restrict movement. Somebody has an injury or some type of like disease that breaks down. Um, either a muscle or a, uh, or the bones. So that's what d- durable medical equipment includes all of those items, um, all of those things that you, that a, a practitioner might prescribe for their patient um, if they need uh, assistance at home with any of those things I described. And so why do practitioners need to know about DME? Well, there are a few reasons why. Uh, you know, the number one example is that providers need to know about DME so that A, they can uh, properly document and prescribe DME for their patients, or B, so that they can properly document, prescribe, and um, also provide those items to their patients, whichever route they decide to take. Okay, and so, and if they aren't distributing it from their office, what, what do they need to have if they aren't distributing it? Okay, so um, in this case, 
they, uh, the, the focus on really on either way, if they're not um, selling it out of their office directly and like billing the insurance provider for the walker or for the wheelchair, then really the, the focus, the main focus that the uh, provider has is making sure that the medical records document a history of need for that device. So um, a, a great way to know that you're documenting correctly is to look at the Medicare uh, local coverage determinations for that product. So if you know if it's if you frequently if the provider frequently um, prescribes back braces because you know the, their practice focuses on you know that area of the body if they frequently prescribe back braces they should um, look up the local coverage determination for a, a, a orthotic um, back brace and uh, read the requirements that Medicare has for that back brace. Um, it will tell the provider what diagnosis codes are appropriate for that particular back brace. It will tell the provider what um, kind of history the patient should have documented in their medical records before the doctor should, um, before the provider should um, prescribe that back brace. It will tell the provider which um, other types of treatments should be tried before moving to that type of back brace. So the local coverage determination from Medicare is sort of your, your guidebook checklist of what needs to go in the documentation before you should prescribe and a, a, a durable medical equipment device um, and you know send your, your patient off to to get that device from another provider, from you know maybe a distributor or a local DME shop, whatever it may be, or you know a mail order type place, but the it the physician needs to know what all information needs to be in that medical record so that they can prescribe it. Now this okay. is important when uh, sorry this is important no, no. when the uh, <laughs> when the patient is uh, going to get their claim paid by Medicare or more likely than not when the uh, durable medical equipment distributor is going to get the claim paid because that distributor will need, may need to provide the documentation from that physician um, to, uh, in order to get the claim paid with either Medicare or in a lot of cases, private insurers too. So um, that is the involvement that a, um, a practitioner has if they aren't going to actually distribute the DME from their office and bill insurance uh, for the you know back brace wheelchair themselves. It's just merely their involvement in the treatment and um, care of the patient and then prescribing the device and then the patient goes out and gets the device from somewhere else. Okay, so then how can a practitioner sell DME directly to a patient? If you want to go this route, if the provider wants to, uh, or the practitioner wants to um, both, you know, treat the patient, order the, um, order and prescribe the durable medical equipment, and then also provide that equipment to the patient and then bill Medicare or private insurance for it, um, the practitioner really needs to be prepared. And um, it's important that they do their homework. I advise um consulting with a healthcare attorney experienced in this area um, and make sure you get the proper compliance and guidance um, because accreditation may be necessary for this type of, uh, if, if you're going to take, take this route because uh, there are certain products that uh, you have to be accredited with, C uh, with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid before you can uh, distribute those products out of your, um, out of your provider office. So. Um, yeah, they, in order to sell DME to a patient directly, there's a lot of boxes that need to be checked, I guess, is, the, is a good way to say it. <laughs> okay, so so would it be then probably easier if they, perhaps if, if they didn't then? <laughs> it is. It, it, it's, it's easier if you don't, but um, if you, um, you know, if you can't, if if you want to start distributing DME, uh, like I said, I would consult with a uh, a healthcare attorney 
or okay. a, a compliance company <laughs> because mm-hmm. there are a lot of star- there are stark implications. So stark self referral okay. implications. Um, if you know you can't just go ahead and start distributing DME, you have to make sure that you're meeting one of the stark law. Um, exceptions. So the Stark law okay. prohibits a physician from referring patients um, to receive certain types of services that are payable by Medicare or Medicaid from entities where the physician has a financial relationship. So for example, you can't, uh, a physician technically should not be able to treat and then order, treat the patient, order a wheelchair, and then also provide that wheelchair to the patient because they're, they could you know, in essence, if you think about it, they can order a wheelchair for everyone and then get paid by Medicare for that wheelchair too. And it would would be a bit of a racket. So technically that's prohibited, but there are certain exceptions that that apply. So the main exception is in-office ancillary services. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to First Talk Compliance, and my guest today is Jill Longo, a healthcare attorney for Health Insure Medical Mutual of Ohio. So how does this ancillary services exception work for practitioners? Okay, so um, if the practitioner wants to provide durable medical equipment, it's limited to certain um, to certain items. It needs to be something the patient needs for ambulate ambulating or a blood glucose monitor. So that's one requirement. Um, The item has to be furnished in the same building as the patient and physician's encounter. So um, that includes, you know, they have to be in the same building. There are a lot of minute details on what a same building means. So that's another area where, you know, you may need a a healthcare attorney to sort of look through um, or analyze your office building, um, and if it's a group practice, how that works if, you know, there's multiple physicians under the same roof, all of that. So that exception can get quite, um, or that requirement of the exception can get a little murky, and that's where you might need a professional to sort of analyze your situation to make sure that the uh, patient and physician encounter where the item is being furnished is happening in the same built building. The item needs to be furnished personally by the physician. So um, you can't uh, order, you know, a back brace for, um, or you can't order a a cane or crutches and then prescribe it to your patient, but then send them out and have, uh, you know, your office assistant or your office manager give that to the person, you, the actual practitioner, whether it be um, physician or physician's assistant, um, any of those uh, types of practitioners, they actually have to personally furnish it to the patient. Um, And then they have to meet the extensive durable medical equipment supplier standards, which is like a three-page supplier um, standards, which has a lot of uh, basically requirements that, uh, that you have to have both in terms of like your building location and staffing and um, hours of operation and all of that um, are all included in the supplier standards. And finally, that you cannot violate the anti-kickback or any other statute in your, in either your state or um, a federal statute. So again, that's uh, another area where if you are thinking about distributing DME out of your provider office, you really need to have your homework done to make sure you're meeting all of these requirements um, and make sure you have an expert with you analyzing it before you move forward with it. So it seems like there's a lot of requirements to follow in order for a practitioner to distribute DME and bill Medicare for. So what are the risks if the practitioner does not have adequate compliance measures in place? Well. Um, there are a few risks. Um, you're, first of all, you're at risk of violating the Stark anti-kickback law, which would have the most uh, uh, repercussions for you and your career, the provider. They, you know, they, that comes along with fines, the potential to be um, placed on the medi- uh, the uh, Medicare exclusion list, all things that you that a provider wouldn't want to have to deal with. Um, Another uh, potential risk is that both 
uh, CMS uh, centers for Medicare and Medicaid and private payers will notice if you suddenly start to bill for these durable medical equipment items. Um, both Medicare and private payers do um, they they do what's called data mining. Um, they search for irregularities in a provider's billing cycle and a provider's billing history. And if suddenly um, you start a uh, provider starts to bill for um, a lot of, you know, back braces or a provider starts to bill for a lot of wheelchairs, they're going to notice and it's going to open you up for um, audits and investigations. Uh, another risk is um, overutilization. So if something seems to be working for this practitioner, you know, like they're seeing a lot of patients, a lot of patients, you know, are complaining of back pain or um, a lot of patients are complaining that they can't walk as well. And then um, they start to prescribe those same items over and over again. You know, that could get the provider in trouble with both through an audit or an investigation, um, either from CMS or, uh, you know, FBI, that kind of thing. If they're over, um, over utilizing those, those billing codes, over utilizing um, that treat, that type, type of treatment, um, it could look suspect. So, uh, because you know, not everybody needs a back brace and not everybody needs a walker, but if everyone's walking out of that, uh, that particular provider's office with one of those items every time, then that's going to cause some, um, some suspicion. Um, and then the other possible um, risk is if you have poor documentation practices, um, you're going to put yourself at risk for uh, not getting your claims paid and not getting uh, the, uh, the claims or not getting the claims paid for this durable medical equipment. So if you are not documenting the um, medical necessity properly within the patient's medical record, then the claims for these items may not get paid. Or if you're not documenting them correctly and, the, and they do get paid sort of in the automatic cycle of things, um, it can come back to haunt you in two to three years because uh, Medicare and private payers can conduct a post-payment audit. They can look through your documentation and uh, find that, you know, you did not properly document. And now that they are trying to uh, recover an overpayment for you for those items. So it's best to, you know, so that those are just some of the risks that uh, you can encounter. So how should practitioners and how can they, what can they do to avoid these risks? Well, um, so the, the best and uh, greatest advice is to um, have very solid compliance and documentation standards in your office. Now, that's, uh, you know, the, the provider should have, so it should always adequately document the medical necessity, as I said before. Um, I mentioned earlier looking at the local coverage determination, um, and this is important whether you are the physician that is or just ordering it and then the patient goes somewhere else to get the item, or if you are the physician ordering it and then you also provide that item directly to the patient. You need to make sure that your documentation is adequate, that you're following the Medicare or private payers medical policy. Um, private payers call them medical policies. Medicare calls them the local coverage determination. So make sure that you look those up. You can Google it. You can um, work with a compliance company to help you find it. But uh, just read through those uh, medical necessity documentation standards um, to make sure that you're following all of the requirements um, for medical necessity. There are also other documentation standards that um, are um, you know generally accepted practices um, across uh, you know the the medical arena and required by Medicare in terms of signatures, um, dates on uh, on the prescriptions, um, the timeline in which uh, you know a a, um, a durable piece of durable medical equipment should be delivered to the patient. So there's really a lot of documentation standards that a provider needs to um, to have in their um, in their radar as they're treating and um, ordering and distributing these advice, uh, um, devices. 
Um, you need to concentrate on not overutilizing any one particular durable medical equipment code. So like I mentioned before, if you are cranking out you know, a back brace to every single one of your patients, um, that can raise some alarms with both you know, um, law enforcement and Medicare and your private payer, and it will open you up to audits. Um, another great um, best practice in terms of compliance is to not only self, is to self audit, but then have a, um, a compliance professional also audit your medical records. So um, you uh, go and you find the local coverage determination and the documentation requirements for whatever services it is you are providing um, to your patients and whatever medical equipment you're providing to your patients. You create um, sort of a, ta a list of um, what should be included in that patient's medical record. And then you um, use that as a guide and you go back and you self audit. You look at, you know, X number of charts for X number of patients over the past three months. And you see how, um, you know, the provider and the staff are doing with following those medical, um, the, the medical policy, local coverage determination and documentation standards. Um, I think self auditing is a great way to make sure that you are compliant. Um, it's a great way to um, learn ways for to be better to better treat your patients and to better document um, the treatment plans. So um, I'm a big proponent of self auditing and also, you know, once or twice a year have an outside uh, compliance auditor come into your office and go and um, conduct just a small sample of audits. So you get an outside perspective too, um, because, you know, a compliance professional or in a, you know, a healthcare attorney has a lot of experience outside of, um, you know, the provide that provider's particular healthcare area and, you know, they can pull in that knowledge um, to let uh, the provider know whether their medical documentation and compliance policies about these certain things are, um, you know, up to snuff and um, comparable to others out in the, uh, um, in the same region and uh, across the medical field. So, um, yeah, self-auditing, making sure you have your documentation standards in place and um, don't overutilize any one particular code. Good, good. We are big proponents of self-audits and self-checks as well here at yeah. First Healthcare <laughs> Compliance too, <laughs> and also obviously of compliance. Good. So how much involvement can a non-physician practitioner such as a NP or a PA have in the DME ordering process? What do you think? Oh. Um, so I, it really depends on your state. Um, that's why I, I know that, um, you know, Medicare has certain um, standards for uh, when nurse practitioners and physician's assistants can be, um, uh, can order these items or, um, but with that said, just because Medicare allows it doesn't mean that your state allows it. So I always urge um, office managers, um, you know, managing uh, physicians and group practices to analyze their state laws to make sure that, you know, it, it's it's okay for a nurse practitioner or, or physician's assistant to be ordering and distributing the durable medical equipment. So that's just an important extra little thing that I like to throw in there because it is a um, an int integral part of the compliance for durable medical equipment. Good, good. And any other tidbits or words of advice? Um, I would just say, you know, um, know, know your requirements, know your legal standards and um, medical necessity, medical policy requirements, um, self-audit. And um, also, I like for providers to have a healthy dose of skepticism if someone is trying to get them to be involved in some type of durable medical equipment distribution process. So, you know, a lot of groups will come along and ask to maybe, you know, they want to be a direct dealer of walkers or wheelchairs or CPAPs or something for that physician. Um, or maybe they want to um, rent a closet in 
the provider's office so that they can distribute durable medical equipment out of that closet from the physician's office or set up a dispensary of some type in there in the physician's office and I always urge providers to be very skeptical of these situations. Be very skeptical of those um, that are offering uh, these kinds of business arrangements because there are a lot of um, regulatory issues with them. And you know, while there are some really great um, partners for durable medical equipment um, that the providers can leverage, uh, it's just you really need to have your wits about you. And if the um, durable medical equipment company is promising you that you will make, um, you know, X amount of money if you start ordering and distributing these items to your patients, then I would take a step back and maybe have a professional help you determine whether it's a um, sound business choice for your practice. That sounds like great, great advice and great (laughs) idea. (laughs) So Jill, thank you so much. Did you have anything else to add on here, Jill? I do not. Thank you so much again for having me, Catherine. Okay, well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jill. I really, really appreciate your time. And thanks to our audience for tuning in to First Talk Compliance. You can learn more about our show on the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com. And lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at FirstHCC, hashtag FirstTalkCompliance. You can also email me at Katherine Short at FirstHCC.com. I'm Katherine Short of First Healthcare Compliance. Remember, compliance is the key to achieving peace of mind.